Um, hi, my name is Rhonda Bender and I'm one of the painters for Reaper Miniatures and I'd like to talk to you today about some ways to paint hair on miniature figures. So um, I brought a couple examples of figures that I painted in the past. So this is an example of a blonde hair on a sculpt where the uh, hair definition uh, is quite strongly defined. And this is an example of more of a redhead, maybe strawberry blonde, on a much finer kind of hair texture. But the, the techniques that I'm going to talk about apply pretty well to either style of sculpting the figure. So when people uh, look at hair on miniatures, it's sculpted with a lot of texture, as you can see here. So it's tempting to think of it, of painting it in the same way as you would paint a lot of textured surfaces like chain mail or wood or I don't know, there's lots of feathers on wings um, and just use techniques like washing and dry brushing to bring out the detail of that texture so it becomes more visible. And in the case of hair, uh, I don't think that really reflects the way that our hair actually looks in real life. If you look at a person, you don't tend to see the individual strands of their hair. You tend to see bands of light and shadow where the light is reflecting off of certain areas and then other areas are shadowed and away from the light. So this example right here is where I started with the same color base coat as on this figure. Then I washed it with the same color I used in the shadows of this figure. And then I dry brushed up with the same highlight colors. But you can see it's very uniform in appearance. There's darkness in between the strands and it's light on top of the strands, but it doesn't reflect the shape of the hair at all. And I don't think it looks very natural. With this example of the figure, I'm not thinking about the strand texture at all while I'm doing the main painting. I'm thinking about the shapes and the volumes of the hair. So it's lighter around the crown where the light's you know, falling down onto the top of the head. It's lighter where it's rolling over her shoulders and the light's falling on there. And then here's a little curl that's poking out so it's light on the top and then dark on the bottom. So when I initially paint this, I don't think about the strand textures at all or the individual locks of hair. At the very end, I'll come through and put a little line in certain places to pull out the this lock of hair is a separate area from this lock of hair. But when I'm painting, I'm treating it a lot more like it's a surface like cloth and thinking about, okay, where is the light gonna fall and make things appear brighter? And where is the light not gonna hit and things are gonna look darker? And then at the very end, I think about, okay, let's make it look a little texture because the sculpture already really did the work for me on this figure. Uh, and then the question of where do you know where to make things lighter and make it a highlight and how do you know where to make things darker and make it a shadow? So I did a very uh, exaggerated example where I went from pure black to pure white on, on this example to help you visualize where you would see things darker and lighter. Now it is going to change a little if you, if you painted her orb as a light source, you would have to think about the light coming from that direction and that's going to affect where you put your shadows and where you put your highlights. For this example, I was not thinking of her orb as a light source, I was thinking of the light as coming more from a typical above direction. Um, is there, Rob, is there an advantage to doing um, dry brushing and washing is a very quick technique, but you are dependent completely on what the sculptor has done and where they have put the texture, so you don't get to say anything about the light. So if you were using this orb as a light source and you used dry brushing and washing technique, the hair wouldn't look as though it were reflecting the light from this orb. You would have to place and, and there's a way to do it a little more deliberately that I'm, I'm going to demonstrate. I only painted half of her head with dry brushing and I'm gonna show you a way to use a similar technique but apply the highlights a little more deliberately on this side. Um, but if you leave everything to the sculpt essentially, which is what if you're just dry brushing and just letting the sculpt pull the paint off your brush, you're not getting to make artistic decisions about the character and the lighting and what's going on in your scene if it's a diorama. So the advantage of placing your paint more deliberately by using layers or wet blending or another technique like that is that 
you get to make decisions and make a statement with your figure. So dry brushing and washing is a lot quicker and it's easier. So if you've got to get your figure on the table for the game tonight, maybe you don't have time to be fancy. If you have a little more time and it's your favorite character, you might want to spend a little extra time using a different technique. I'd also like to talk about colors a little bit for hair. Um, using the, you can use similar techniques to paint just about any hair color and hair is one of those things, I mean we see people sometimes with green hair and pink hair and blue hair. Uh, so we see that in the real world, certainly fantasy characters and science fiction characters you're going to see some interesting hair colors so you use basically just the same techniques regardless of the hair color. Uh, one thing that I think is important to note about hair, choosing colors for hair, is if you want a nice shiny healthy looking hair you're going to need a fairly large value contrast. So value is whether a color is dark or light. You're going to need pretty dark colors for your shadows and very light colors for your highlights regardless of if you're painting a dark brunette or a light blonde. Your blonde is still going to need some dark colors in the shadows and your brunette is still going to need some light colors in the highlights because having dark and light together on the same surface, especially if you can get them close to one another, is what makes our eyes see something as shiny. Um, so Reaper has two hair triads, I think. They have one for red hair and one for blonde hair, and they're both great triads. But for painting shiny type hair, you're going to need to add some additional shadow colors and probably add some additional um, highlight colors. So for this example, I've chosen to use the blonde um, triad. So this, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the whole range that I picked. In this very dark color, because I'm painting a blonde, it's a darker blonde, but it's still painting a blonde, that's really just going to be used for lining. So I would put that around, um, she's got a little tiara or something on her hair. So I'm just going to use that to like outline the tiara or around where her face and skin meet. That's not really a color that I'm going to include in the hair. So this is um, russet brown, which I think is a great shadow color for blonde hair. It also works with the ivory bone triad. I, I paint blonde sometimes with that and I mix the shadows with russet brown. Uh, this is blonde shadow, this is blonde hair, this is blonde highlight, and this particular white is dragon white but any pure white, any white would do for this purpose. There's not enough of a difference for, we're just using it for little tiny highlights so it doesn't really matter which one you pick. I've made a couple of intermediary mixes between my two colors. Uh, between the blonde shadow and the russet brown and the blonde hair and the blonde shadow. Just that will help get nicer transitions when I show you that style of painting. And how did you mix the two together? Uh, I pretty much just mix one drop of each and mix them together with my brush. You will find that some colors uh, tint more strongly than others. So a strong tinting color is if you add a little bit of blue to yellow, you will get green or you may even still see it as blue because yellow is a very weak color and blue is usually a very strong color. So if you want something that looks like it's in the middle of these two colors, you aren't always going to get that by adding one part of this color and one part of this color. You're going to have to experiment on your palette and see, oh, this color is really weak. I need to have two drops of that with one drop of this to get the color to, that looks in between those two. First, I would like to show you um, a method that's still going to be pretty quick, like doing dry brushing and washing, but gives you a little more control. So what I've done here is I painted the entire hair area with the blonde shadow color, and then I made a wash with russet brown, and I placed it all over the entire hair area and then I allowed it to dry. So on this side uh, is where I did standard dry brushing. What I'd like to show you now is you probably still could use dry brushing. I like to think of it as damp brushing. You're still using the texture of the figure to pull the paint off, but you're not getting your brush as dry. Um, so I'll dip my brush in a little bit. I'm going to start with the original um, blonde shadow because I did the, the wash with the russet brown. I've covered over some of the brown shadow on the upper areas, so I need to put that back. So let me just, let me just swap the lady out for a minute. And so I'm dipping my, paint, my brush into the paint, 
and then I'm just wiping a little bit off so it's just not a messy amount of paint on there. So I'm not going crazy like this to turn it into a dry brush. I just want to have a controlled amount of paint on there instead of a big glop. So right now that's a big glop. It's not entirely focusing. And then I'm just getting off the excess. And now what I'm going to do is look for those raised areas that I talked about and just draw the brush along the top of those. So the crown of her head, where the hair goes over the shoulder, that little curl. So I'm trying not to cover the russet brown that's in the, where the folds of her hair dip under. Well, the curls of her hair, not the folds of her hair. So now I'm going to start putting in some highlights. So I'm going to go up to, I'm going to go straight to the blonde highlight since we're doing this as a quicker technique and we've got to get her on the table and ready to play tonight. So I want to cover a slightly smaller area than I covered with the blonde shadow. So I'm building up my highlights. If I put everything in the exact same place, it's kind of like I went straight from my original color to my brightest color and it's gonna look really choppy and unattractive. So I need to leave a little bit of the color that I painted previously showing and start building this color up in smaller areas. So that's the um, blonde hair. So I think I said blonde highlight before. That's the blonde hair color. So I started with blonde shadow. I've put a layer of blonde hair on and now I'm going to put a layer of blonde highlight. And because you're placing it in smaller and smaller areas each time, it starts getting faster it, as, you, uh, as you don't need as much paint. So I'm almost really just dotting on a few little places. And then if I wanted, I could go all the way up to the white to try to make her hair look really shiny. And there I'm just, I really am gonna dot. I'm just gonna touch the brush a couple of places to give her that you know, she uses the good hair conditioner kind of shine. Is that Pert Plus? Yeah, Pert Plus. Maybe even better, maybe she's got L'Oreal even. Um, so, I mean, it's not a super fancy paint job, but I think that it looks better than just dry brushing every strand so that the hair has a completely uniform look. You can see more of the shape of the curls of her hair the way I just painted it, but it didn't take me any longer. It may have actually taken less time because I didn't have to dry brush every strand down all of the parts. So that's, that's an alternative to doing a quick gaming type uh, paint job for hair. Now I'd like to show you uh, a little bit more of the more involved way to paint hair. If you were painting, you know, your favorite player character or you wanna try coming down to ReaperCon and entering the uh, painting contest that we have, you might wanna spend a little extra time and be very deliberate in how you place your uh, shadows and highlights. So the system I'm using is called layering. There are lots of different ways to do this. If you know how to use wet blending or two brush blending, there's lots of different names for different techniques. Whatever method you use that allows you to apply the shadows and highlights where you want them to be is, is what we're aiming to use here. Um, if you're not familiar with any of these, the, the technique of layering that I use is described in more detail in um, Reaper's Learn to Paint kit called Layer Up, which I wrote a while back. Um, maybe someday I'll do one on here. Uh, so I'm gonna use the exact same colors that I used for the, uh, the quick gaming style paint job. But in this case, since I don't have any of that shadow color, the russet brown, I'm not gonna use a wash, I'm gonna use layering. I need to start by adding in some of my shadows. Uh, I prefer to paint by starting with a mid-tone color. In this case, this is the golden or the blonde shadow. Uh, and then painting in my shadows and adding my highlights. If you prefer to do the highlights first and then the shadows, it doesn't make a huge difference. For me personally, I find it a little easier to visualize the volumes and the structure of the shapes of things when I do the shadows first. But it's, that's kind of a personal choice decision of which order to paint that in. Uh, if you aren't familiar with visualizing the light and shadow, um, 
I might recommend trying the starting with the middle color and adding in shadows and highlights just to help you start to visualize that. So just bring my, bring this scroll back for a minute. This is an example of visualizing where the highlights and the shadows go. And I made it so that you see where the, the various transition lines are. So this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be placing layers of paint on the figure one over another. I could have started with the very darkest color and then gone to the next color gray and then the next lighter color gray all the way up to white. Um, and you should end up with a similar looking effect. It's just thinking about where are you placing darker colors and where are you placing lighter colors and then where are you placing mid-tones. Um, so let's, let's just think about this idea and you can take, so I um, painted these figures with gray paint before we started this demonstration so that they show up better on the camera but also to help you see it's hard to see how dark a color is or how light a color is as long as there's something extreme on it. So if you use black primer or you use white primer, those are both very extreme values. And your other colors may not appear the same as they would once you completely paint the figure. Um, so once you get all of the black or white primer off of something, it often looks different. But some of the colors look different than you thought they did. So my first shadow layer is a mixture between the um, blonde shadow base coat and the russet brown that I'm using to add shadows. And I also just like to note for the viewers that I normally paint with a magnifier because I'm old. So <laughs> I don't promise that the painting will be as precise as it normally would be. So I just got some paint off my palette and I'm not, I don't dip just the tiny tip of my brush in so I don't always have the correct load of paint. So I will often check against my, my holder or just dab it on my paper towel before I put it on the miniature to make sure that I don't get paint that just goes wild and goes everywhere all over the figure. So especially if you start thinning your paint for applications like glazes and sometimes it's helpful to thin for layers, um, you're going to want to get some of that paint off of your brush before you touch it to the miniature. She has a lot of hair. Uh, this is Sarah the Seeress. Seeress. She's an, like a prophet, oracle type person, I guess. Um, and she's a great character to practice painting hair on because she has such nice folds of hair and everything. But she has a lot of it. So I'm not going to try to paint the entire amount of hair on camera. I'm just going to show you some examples of how I would paint. So that would be my first layer of shadow which I need to let dry before I apply my second layer. If I started uh, applying paint right now, it's possible that I could pull up some of the paint that isn't dry yet with the new paint, and then I would get this patchy look. Sometimes it's also the case, you know, I'm looking now and I realize, oh, I didn't get any paint here, any darker paint here, and there should be some. So it's okay to come back and have to do multiple layers with the same color to build up the color intensity or make sure you got everything where you want it to be. So that's an example of my first, what I would do with my first shadow layer. I think the difference in painting hair is that you probably have a little less mid-tone because you want to have dark values that are fairly placed fairly close to light values. So there may not end up being a lot of the blonde shadow showing by the time I'm done because we'll have built in a lot of shadows and highlights. Uh, whether there are more shadows or more highlights is gonna depend a lot on the way the hair is sculpted. So if there's a lot of you know, curls that flip up and face the light, you're gonna have more light colors. If there's a lot of parts that fold down and aren't receiving as much light, you're gonna have a lot of shadow. Uh, I would also say concentrate more light here, especially if we're looking at the front of the figure I'm going to go brighter on my highlights around her face to help draw attention to her face. And I'm not going to put super bright highlights here or here because that's much further down the figure. So they're not getting as much light, but also just because I would want to be keeping the attention of the viewer on the face, which is always, you know, a focal point for anyone. If there's, if your miniature has a visual, a visible face, that is a focal point of the miniature and people are going to want to look there and you want to help make their eyes go towards the face. 
we'll turn her back around because we want her to look interesting from the back too. So now I'm going to go to my darkest shadow color, which in this case is the russet brown. And just as I was talking about with the gaming style paint job, if I cover all of the areas over there where I just put that other shadow, I'm going to, you're going to see just the really dark color next to the really light color. So I need to place it within the areas that I place. So I started up here on the previous shadow layer and I'm starting much further down on the next shadow layer. So just kind of the darkest recesses where the folds are really curling under and facing away from the light. And so all this little underside areas, I'm not going to be able to paint all of those on the camera because we're going to run out of time. But just as it would be lighter up here, it's going to be darker overall down here. Definitely a little bit down there, that fold is facing way under. And I'm going to call that good for shadows on the area that we're focusing on painting right now. So now I'm going to switch over to the highlights. But one thing I could do is if I felt I had been a little sloppy with my shadow application, all I have to do is come back with my original color, the, the gold shot or blonde shadow, and I could just, you know, cover up some of those previous shadows and, and fix it. So the nice thing about acrylic paint is it covers over itself. Once it's dry, you just paint over and fix your mistakes. It's a very forgiving paint form. So my first highlight is going to be a mixture between the blonde shadow and the blonde hair. And now I'm going to be applying to that to where the curls fold upwards. And you notice I'm, I'm not worrying too much if I get some highlight color in between the locks or the strands. I'm not thinking about this as a textured surface right now. I'm painting this just like if it were a cloak or like leather armor or some other kind of uniform surface. This is, I don't care about the hair strands. I'll come back to that later. This may be the hardest thing about trying to paint hair this way is just to not even think about the strands. Just think about this is an overall curl of hair that, that's facing upwards here and facing downwards there. The same with this. Now, if we were painting the whole thing, I would also be painting some nice highlights along the crown of her hair. That's a very important area to highlight, but I think we can see a little better on these nice curls that she has going down her back. So that was the first highlight layer, so it took a little bit, but now we're going to go straight to the blonde hair, and it's going to start picking up and being faster to paint each of these layers because I'm going inside of where I already painted. I don't want to cover over all of the work that I did. I just want to add some brighter colors inside of those colors. And you can already see that it's starting to build up the appearance of some shine. So now I'm going to go up to the blonde highlight, and that's going to go in an even smaller area. So just even little dabs of my brush instead of like line strokes. Uh, now for my final highlight layer, I'm going to add a bit of white, and this is kind of um, like the idea of like really bright reflections from the light. So I'm just going to add little dot spots of this just to my brightest areas. And I'm probably, you know, maybe I'll put one here, but because this area overall should be darker, I'm really not going to go as bright or as large on the highlights down there. So my next stage would be, and I, I would probably do some of this as I was going along, but different processes work for different people. I'm going to assess this and see if everything looks like I think it should look. And one thing I'm seeing here is that there's really, there's a lot of shadow and then there's highlight. So there really isn't a bit of a transition point between that you see here, there's highlight and then a bit of the middle color and then it goes to the darker colors. So I'm going to take a little bit of those middle colors, mid-tones, and just add those back in. And that's kind of what I mean about um, acrylic paint being very forgiving there's no problem for me to adjust my vision of what the figure should look like at a later point. You can always be looking at things and thinking, oh, 
you know, is there a way I can make this a little better or change this to do a little more of what I want to do. So overall, I feel like she just didn't quite have enough of the, not the top highlights, but the kind of just the slightly brighter than mid-tone highlights. So now is the point where I would worry about, oh, we should define some locks of hair and separate some areas from another, or maybe pull out a few strands. So I come in with my shadow color, my russet brown, and this is something I will occasionally um, customize to the area. So the russet brown might look too dark as a line right here, but not dark enough down here. So this is kind of depends on how fancy you want to get. But here I come in and you need a brush with a nice tip to do this. And just kind of pick out a few areas where I'm pulling out individual strands or locks of the hair. The other thing I would do is um, she has a little hair decoration. So I want to make sure to outline all around that right now while I have all my hair colors out. So if I make a mistake, it's easy to fix. Then later, I'm just going to go over that with gold or silver or something like that. And she's got kind of a hair band there. And then you can see once you start adding in those little strands and the lines that it really helps define everything. And I would come in and line all around where the hair meets the cloth as well. Because her hair is going to cast a shadow on her clothing. So it's going to look darker where the hair meets her clothing. Hair is actually an excellent surface to start practicing a technique like layering on. Because it's textured, you don't have to be as precise and you're not going to see the, the transition lines that if you've ever tried uh, layering and you hated that you could see a lot of lines in between the light, lighter highlights and your shadows and stuff. Hair is a much more forgiving surface because you should see little kind of choppy texture because the strands the individual strands are breaking the light up a little bit. So that's the basics of how I uh, paint hair on my miniatures. And hopefully that will help you paint better hair on yours. So once again, my name's Rhonda Bender. Uh, I, and I paint miniatures for Reaper, but I also like to talk about painting on my blog, birdwithabrush.com. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reaper Toolbox.